I'm talking about multi shell photographers, is to start with uh, this. This is just news of uh, a friend of ours, a very, very respected photojournalist, um, who died early out of this morning. Um, at the beginning of Chubimala, we mentioned several people who should have been here. In fact, one of the photographers in the series that I'm going to show you, one of the uh, studio owners of photographers, um, Bimal Kumar Dash, also passed away a few days. He was meant to be coming here. Um, I just want to show respect to our colleague here. I'll go on to uh, the presentation we're talking about. Um, and the reason we decided to do this was um, to remember the, the contribution of many people who are not classically recognized and have not been appreciated uh, within the medium and within society as such. We had also, at the rig, begun to collect material from 1971. And in 1996, we put together a calendar. Um, but later on, I began to think of these people, because the photographers who documented 71 and events around that have really the only uh, material uh, that um, remembers that event, they are the only document documentarians of that time. Yet, while their work is used and abused in so many ways, they've never been remembered. So, I wrote a piece, a very tiny piece that's an introduction to that calendar, and I rewrote it again ten years later, seeing it had never changed. Now, I'll just read that very briefly. Thirty-five years ago, even longer perhaps, just a camera in hand, they had gone out to bring a fragment of living history. Today, these photographs joined them in protest. Peering through the crisp pages of the newly printed history books, they remind us, no, that wasn't the way it was. I know. I bear witness. The black and white 120 negatives, carefully wrapped in flimsy polythene, stashed away in a damp gamcha, have almost faded. The emulsion eaten away by fungus, scratched a hundred times in their tortuous journey, yellowed with age. They bear little resemblance to the shiny negatives in the modern archives of big name agencies. They too are war weary, bloodied in battle. So many have sweet talked these negatives away. The government, the intellectuals, the publishers, so many. Some never came back. No one offered a sheet of black and white paper in return. Few gave credit. The ones who risked their lives to preserve their memories of the language movement have never been remembered in their awards given that day. 35 years ago, they fought for freedom. They didn't all carry guns. Some made bread, some, made, yes, some gave shelter, some took photographs. And I say that because that applies to photographers at many levels. And the group of phot photographers we're looking at now are from studios in what are called Mofferschel towns. Mofferschel towns are small towns, not, not things like Dhaka city, but small towns, not villages. And they have a culture of their own, and uh, photographers have worked there in many ways. The studios, most of the studios have disappeared. One of the problems, um, of course, is economic. And the econ economic one isn't simply about preserving this material, but also the pressures upon them to do something to, to give away their material. So some have sold away their cameras, the studios themselves have gone. The negatives are in demand because there are people who recollect, um, the collect or re retrieve the silver from the negatives. So a lot of old negatives are sold in bulk for silver collection. There are studios who retain their negatives knowing they will have no commercial gain, not even selling them for silver, and continue to do so. There are about, uh, in the archaeology department, there is about um, over 10,000 8x10 glass plates collecting fungus over years. I've been talking to the government for, for many, many years. They're out there in the open collecting fungus, dying every day. They will probably be thrown away for scrap at some point. 
yet no attempt is being made to preserve it. So our attempt really was to try and understand these people, try and recognize what they do. And in countries like ours, the division between a professional photographer and an amateur photographer and a citizen journalist isn't so great. I mean, everyone does everything, and many people have to do many jobs in order to survive, uh, and it's a mixture like that. So I'll, I'll go quickly through these things. Um, so I'm not going to read up everything to go with them, some of the old cameras which are still there. And as you might imagine, some of these pictures and some of these cameras collectors want, but these are photographers who hung on to them regardless, and I, I find that very interesting. So uh, one of the things which is also interesting is the J.J. Farish articles about uh, image and how the colonial image need to be propagated uh, started around 19, 1839, which is about the time photography started. And the two have gone together. So colonialism has a, a long history um, of you know, collusion with photography in that sense. Um, but here, photography did come fairly early, more in Kolkata than in Dhaka, and more in Dhaka than in the Mofreshal towns. But they've, they've still played that role. So um, we started this in 2017. We started the original collection in the early 90s. Robert is there. We started collecting images of 71. But then, more recently, we felt it was important to uh, collect work beyond that as well, from ordinary people, from non-photographers, and particularly from these studios. Uh, we started the work very late in history, and our challenge was not only to read photography, but also to read absence and decode absence, to trace the history of photographic practice. Um, and when we started, we found ourselves in a schoolyard. Uh, this is what remains of uh, the Horilal Shen, the first owner of a studio in East Bengal, uh, left his land before um, partition uh, in 19, uh, 1947. And at that place now is the school and the schoolyard. And when you look at this, there really is no trace of what might have been. What this project tries to do is to document and understand the vernacular history of photography. We've done it in six Mofreshal towns, um, engaging with young photographers, rural multimedia journalists, um, and historical surveys. We have a small project called the Rural Visual Journalism Network. And these are, uh, our idea was to have 64 correspondents in the 64 uh, districts of Bangladesh. We've had about 43 who've covered them. And they started working with um, the iPod Touch, doing sto small multimedia stories. But we worked with them, and we worked with Pachala students. The idea was also to train Pachala students in research methodology. Um, and I'm sorry at the moment that our lead researcher, Dr. Saidia Gulruk, is not here. Her, her mother passed away in Canada, and she, she's gone there. She will arrive tomorrow. And we couldn't rearrange this program at such a short time. So she should have, should have been presenting this ideally. But Saivia, with her team, have been training the Pachala students in research methodology. And they've gone out and worked with us on this project. It was also supported by the Prince Last Fund. So this is the schoolyard. And uh, what is interesting is um, the next picture I'm going to show you. The first one, this is all we have. We don't even have the studio or the person. We just have a recollection of where it was, where the school now is. Um, in Manikganj, um, the problem was not only partition, but uh, uh, the things that happened after it. We'll come to that. Uh, <coughs> In Rajshahi, it was 1971, and what had happened, and this is interesting, the Pakistani army, at least in Rajshahi, specifically targeted photographic studios. We don't know exactly why this was done, but they targeted photographic studios and destroyed them. Um, so uh, we have 
and what we've been able to get are in this sort of a, uh, a manner. You know, you've got the, as I talked about, the torn negatives, you've got the torn prints as well. And in some cases, this is all that is left. Teramites have had them, but these fragments are what we've uh, collected. What is also interesting are the lifestyles that have been lost. So you've got, for instance, here, you will see in the Roshit Talukdar exhibit a uh, picture of Gundana, people pulling boats against the wind, against the stream. This is very common, but today with motorized boats, you no longer see this. These are people on land pulling, towing um, uh, a boat upstream or against the current or against the wind. I'll go fairly quickly through some of these. We're short of time. But the next picture is, for me, very significant because it shows the ordinary people who fought um, our war of liberation. And today, there's a huge debate going on about who should get benefit, who should be rewarded for um, having participated in the War of 71. And there is a list of freedom fighters. This list includes people who would have been eight years old at that time. And apparently, people are, you know, um, your family, your grandchildren are also eligible. And they get rights to better government jobs and things like that. So there's a huge nepotism associated with it. But the real people who fought the war, the ordinary Bangladeshis, are very rarely remembered. And of course, even more rarely photographed. But these are things that these studios who might have been involved themselves took. Um, I'll just show you some general pictures which we've been able to collect. I'm not going to dwell on that. I would like this more to be a discussion. When you go to the Patshala uh, building, you will notice on the first floor a print, um, maybe 40 inches by 40 inches, uh, by a photographer who has recently passed away. He was the elder brother of a very famous photographer, Aman al -Hak. What's very interesting in that image is there is not a single corrugated tin sheet. Today, in Bangladeshi villages, you will, you, it's unheard of. They're all thatched houses. And there was a time. This, was, this picture was taken about 65 years ago. It's an original print. The negative doesn't exist. The print is all we have. But it does talk about a typology, a geography, a whole range of other information that these photographs carry. Um, in a situation where there's no tangible photographer, the memory of a photograph sometimes opened up a window to the past. And the next images are by Muhammad Nurul Islam, who's 93. We'd invited him to come. And obviously, it was um, not um, feasible for him to come. He was given a camera by his employer, uh, which was the collector's office. He has no photographs that he took of that time because the photographs have been retained by the office. But he has vivid memories of two photographs that he had taken of Ayub Khan and Muhammad Ali Jinnah in 1962. So what we have is the oral history, uh, but no physical manifestation of that image. And we've given value to that as well. So oral history, other artifacts we might get, in some cases photographs, sometimes negatives. So this is. Um, all that he has from that time, but he was able to tell us the history of these pictures that he'd taken of um, Ayub Khan and Muhammad Ali Jinnah. We walked door to door looking through body of photographic works, um, and we realized we were working with organic archives, archives which emerged with no institutional support, no formal attention, they evolved and devolved for various reasons, not always ex explicable even by the people who did them. But you know, you've got maybe a little writing at the back, a faded, faded photograph like that, or uh, um, you know, the studio advert, uh, which you know is all that remains in some cases. This is Bishonat Dash's studio in Jashore. Um, then I'm going to go on to a small series of pictures. Uh, I'm going relatively fast through this because we're short of time. 
Uh, but again, the photographic typology, we have worked by, I don't know if Shamsul Alam Hilal is here, uh, but some of you will have looked at Love Story that we showed in a previous Chubby Mala, the contemporary studios. These are also very classed. You know, you will have well-to-do people having their photographs taken overseas or in Bangladesh in more upmarket studios. More down market studios will have more quiche material, the picture from Thailand, or uh, a very bright, gaudy image, a telephone. Or, nowadays, you don't get the telephone because everyone has a mobile phone, but you have sort of other artifacts. They have, uh, and this is something that we found. In one of the studios, we came across a sari and a jacket that they had, which they would give out to people who would dress up to look good for those photographs. So you have all the people who came, or many of the people who came to the studio, all wearing the same jacket and the same sari, but this is a special moment that they've come for. Uh, the images, of course, are in some cases more tortured than others. And I'll just go through some of these. Um, uh, I don't really have very much to say. The next image uh, has a little bit of hand tinting. Um, this was very common. It's difficult to find now. Uh, I remember, just, just as an aside, when Martin Parr came over to Bangladesh, um, this is before Chobi Mala, I took him to Jijira, which is uh, across the river. Um, and we went to a small studio, and he had a black and white portrait of him done. And they, they hand tinted it for him and gave it to him. That happens to be the cover of his book of portraits. Um, so there's a little bit of history there. We will come across another picture later on where there's some red. The red was used mostly on negatives of paper negatives. Because to print, the red acted as an opaque. So it made it easier to dot rather than dodging and burning every image, particularly if you wanted to make several copies. But I noticed that there was a tinge of red in one of the prints. I'm not sure why that is. Um, I'm just going through pictures to give you a sense of the type of imagery uh, that exists. But these are studio photographers who would certainly not have been commissioned to take these pictures, but they took them all the same. Um, so they would have gone to weddings, they would have taken pictures of people who came, but they would all have also have gone out to take photographs that they found interesting for whatever reason. Um, it was not the time when picture postcards were made, or commercially there would have been very little option um, to get reward for this material, and film was very expensive at that time. So someone who was doing this was actually investing a lot um, both time and money to be producing material like this. And it stayed in the studio uh, without having any commercial interest and is still being maintained. Uh, there's a photographer who recently passed away, Murtaza uh, Taufik al-Islam. He was from Chittagong. And the man broke down when he was telling me he was ill. Uh, he had two studios in Newmarket, and the family threw away his entire neg set of negatives. And this is a man who's, oh, through all this, preserved his work, not knowing what might happen to it, and then his own family threw it away. Uh, and I, I say this because it's, it's a collective responsibility, I, I feel. You know, this culture for preservation, for valuing um, material that needs to be archived is something we need to inculcate, we need to tell the establishment. These are individuals who do not have anywhere near the resources to preserve it, but it is our history that is going. I'm not sure what the next picture is about, because it looks as if it might be someone who's passed away, but it's not clear. Um, but um, the, I'll just talk briefly about how these photographers became photographers. They, they worked as apprentices, often as darkroom attenders making tea and learned to do the craft. Um, there was, uh, I remember, uh, Golam Qasim Dadi, our most senior photographer who died at the young age of 103. He was born in 1894. 
Uh, and he has a very interesting story. He talks about how um, a, a girl he particularly fancied had told him that if you can develop a roll of film, I'll cook you dinner. So that was quite good inten uh, incentive. So Ghulam Qasim Dadi tries to do, you know, follows the rules of doing it, but the emulsion constantly comes off. And no one is going to tell him why this is happening until he was able to make friends with a particular studio. And they told him that you needed to use alum, a hardener, because the photographic literature is written for lower temperature countries. Ilford or Kodak didn't really develop uh, literature for Bangladeshi working conditions. So at the higher elevated temperatures, as you did the processing, the emulsion would just peel off um, the material, the backing itself. And it's only when you put in alum, the hardener, that, that could stay. So Golam Qasim learned to do the hardener and process the film. I didn't get to ask him how, what the dinner was like, but we have some of his archives. Uh, at our end. But this is a picture I was taking, talking about. We don't really know what this picture is about. We can only surmise, but I suspect it might be shortly after a person passed away. I personally have a print taken by, uh, not taken, but uh, a professional photographer came over to take pictures of one of my uncles who's also passed away. <coughs> and what was for me, very significant about this image is, you know, there, there are the kids, there's the father, and he says, this is a photograph of my mother. The mother isn't there in the photograph. The mother is behind the curtain. But that's what he remembers. That there we were, because there was Parda, my mother couldn't be visible, but she was there behind the curtain that we were standing on, and for him, that is the picture of his mother. That, that black curtain. Again, um, photographs at various stages of decay, um, some of these more formal. Um, we will have these sort of family albums of that type, of that time. You will notice the complexion, and that is largely because of the red dye which is used on the negative to smoothen things, uh, to make people more fair, because we are in a very racist society where being fair is beautiful. Um, so that was a common practice. Um, what I'm not seeing on that picture, which one would normally do in a picture of that time, is a black dot on the forehead of the, of the girl, because that is often used to, so people do not covet um, the child and you know, you don't get, coveting a child is, the word is nazar. You know, by doing that, you actually um, bring danger to the person. So often, you would have a child prettied up in a dress and everything else, uh, mother trying to make the child as beautiful as possible and putting a black dot on the head so the child is not coveted, so others are not envious of the child. Um, I'm going through. Now, what is happening here, and I'll, I'll talk about it a little more briefly. While all this is happening, um, the, the importance of photography commercially isn't so great. So these studios found it difficult to survive, but there were some occasions uh, where it would happen. Some also did what we would call glamour photography. And the glamour photography here is, in some ways, not so dissimilar to this Hollywood style of photography, you do not have uh, a soft light. You, you actually have um, these as bowl lights put in, not as diffused as one might do in contemporary photography. But you've still got the side light, the back light, the rim light, two-point lighting, three-point lighting. And obviously, people went and posed, and this is I've seen some beautiful work of this sort. There used to be a studio called Zaivi, a very famous studio here, which has now gone away. And you still have some of these images with Zaivi signed. The studio still survives in Pakistan. Oh, the name of the studio still survives in Pakistan. 
And one of the things we're hoping to do is to go to Pakistan and interview the photographers there to find out about the history of the original Saidi Fudio. The next one is um, quite a uh, chic young man. Uh, I love this image. Um, the, uh, the posture, the gesture, and the way it's been done is, is quite beautiful. But this obviously would have been a commissioned photograph but it was not commissioned in the conventional way. It's very modern in, in some ways. The next photographer is Mojahar Ali, who was a school teacher in Bogra, but he started my studio towards the end of the 60s. Um, uh, but what he also has are photographs of his own family, which we don't have so much of in the other cases. So there is Mojahar Ali with his wife, and on the back it, it actually says, um, Ami or Begum. Begum is the general word for wife or woman. Um, we have it here, Komala, Abir, and Samir in his studio, in my studio. But this would have been his own family being photographed. The next one is for me interesting. It's a picture which is, uh, I mean, obviously it's posed, it's taken in a studio, but the unkempt hair is deliberately kept for this picture, which is quite unusual. You would normally have all that, but there's a careful, careless beauty uh, being attempted here, which is uh, quite interesting. And the other one, next one, is the more conventional, uh, you know, the sunglasses, the posture. Uh, you've got to go. Pick it. Um, so this is his wife, um, and that's done. The next picture is interesting. The Bangladeshis will perhaps uh, will know the person, but not, might not recognize it. This is Dr. Zafar Iqbal, yeah, when he was a child. And this is a picture of, he's, he's a famous science fiction writer, um, uh, novelist here. Uh, and we didn't know that his pictures, he himself might never have seen this picture. We found it in this studio. The next one is of uh, scouts, Iranian scouts. I don't know what they were doing here. Uh, it, it was Lahore, 1964. Uh, but the photographer found it important. I'm going to quickly go through because we run into the next time already. Now, a shift took place after partition. Uh, because after partition, then there was the idea of uh, the passport. Before, we'd never needed passport, but suddenly you need the passport to cross borders and for other reasons. So suddenly there was a demand for studios for their photographs. Most of this was um, the passport photographs, many of them, and there were also court photographs. Um, and they took place through these minute cameras, the wooden cameras that were next to the studios. Uh, you would photograph them, you would, uh, and the camera was also a dark room. And what is interesting is that they had a one soup developer. It, it was obviously too complicated to have uh, a developer, a stop bath, a fixer, and a wash. So they actually had in the same soup both developer and fixer. So it, the print would be developed and fixed simultaneously. And then it would be very quickly rinsed re-photographed to produce um, the print. But that, this is the time when these sort of ID pictures became important. You needed them for uh, bureaucratic reasons, for passports and things like that. In some cases, we were able to, uh, we weren't able to find photographs from the photographer himself. It was always a he, but he could tell us who had commissioned him, and we were able to go to those people and from their family photographs or their albums retrieve things. But Zede Raza was someone, again, who was quite celebrated and sought after as a wedding photographer in Rongpur. But, uh, and this is his wife, who was his primary muse. And his whole inspiration was based on, you know, this muse being there. Once his wife died, he gave up photography. His muse had gone, so he never kept it, kept it 
and he perhaps didn't value it now that we've gone back and asked for him. He didn't have any of the pictures, but he was able to tell us of who, whose wedding he had photographed, and we were able to go to them, and from their album retrieve pictures, um, which some of which were of various things he could then recognize. The next picture, this one is interesting because photography would have been commissioned. Not, the average person would not have images of, um, would not be affluent enough to have uh, pictures taken just for nothing. But this is obviously a stage situation which has been photographed. It's not the typical sitting down posed for a formal event, but a theatrical situation which has been put together and commissioned to be photographed, which we found quite interesting. A wedding, and you don't have this so much now before. Um, both the bridegroom and the bride were meant to be very shy. It was, shyness was a sign of virtue. Um, so you have the bridegroom covering his face with uh, a napkin. This is almost died out today. It re certainly in modern weddings, in city weddings, this will not happen. It's considered very old school. But you will still get this in villages today. But this is a time when a well-to-do family would also uh, do that. Um, just uh, quickly going through. This is the one where I noticed the red. I'm not sure what the red was about. Um, because it doesn't look as if it's been hand tinted. It look, almost looks as if this was being attempted on a paper negative, but uh, it's, it's a mystery. Other tropes, um, obviously a blessing, uh, a child being blessed or things like that. The more typical picture. There's one picture coming up later which I was reminded of when I looked at Peter's pictures of the child with a goat. But everyday scenes. So now we are getting, as photography uh, is being more used, uh, these are sort of situations where uh, studio photographers are told to do slightly different things. So these are the more formal situations. And the next one is the child with a goat I was telling you about. Yeah. Now we have something interesting coming up. In the beginning of the 90s, uh, we see studio photographers trying experimentation documentary photography. In our archives, we have a set of pictures from an exhibit in 1965, which one of our senior photographers, Bijan Shorka, did. It was, as far as we know, the first exhibit of experimental photography in Pakistan done by Bijan Shorka. But these are things that were done in these Mokrishal studios, uh, quite fascinating images. The other thing is the fact that you've actually got contact sheets. Now, contact sheets are not very common. Very, very few photo photographers. We have this incredible collection of uh, over 165,000 negatives of Roshit Salukda, not a single contact sheet by him. There are very, very few photographers whose work is supported by contact sheets. So, um, it's interesting to, and then you can see what they did, how they did, how they went from one to one. What is interesting here also is that you have the frame numbers, the edge numbers. I say that's interesting because many of us, and me included, uh, to save money, we would buy the back end of cine stock. Once they take cine film, there's about so many feet of film at the end, which is not usable for Sydney because it's too short. And they would sell it away and we would buy them and cut them up and we call them refills, put them in canisters. A problem was that they didn't have frame numbers. Here you have numbers. So these were authentic film that had been bought, which is you know, more expensive, something we didn't always, we weren't always able to do. The next three pictures are a little sequence of fire that this photographer has done three different situations of the use of fire. It looks as if it's herring being taken in, but I, I have no idea. It probably isn't, uh, because that wouldn't have been shown in that way, but I just found it, the similarity interesting. So a mini-series of sorts. And here we have um, a public situation, a religious event uh, where uh, uh, you know, the photographer has gone and taken pictures. So it's more 
journalistic in a sense, uh, um, which the photographers are beginning to do. Uh, the next ones are another type of experimental photography, m multiple exposures and things like that. Of course, it was all black and white. They were doing the prints themselves, so they did some experimentation. Sometimes it's for glamour, but sometimes other things as well. And the next picture is the same woman, one without, with glasses, without glasses. And um, I'm not really sure in what way this, how this would have been commissioned. Um, now, what happens at this stage, we were looking at the 90s, uh, digital photography begins to come in, and of course that really affects the studio photographs because the setup costs for digital photography is very, very high. So it meant a small, a small number of studios in Dhaka or the major cities got the business, and they would do the printing and everything else. So these studios struggled. Um, they didn't see the value or weren't able to preserve their work. Um, <coughs> and they are very resentful of digital photography. Uh, it also resulted in loss of relationships because the studios were uh, some sort of a connection of dots between various people. Um, so we have here uh, a photographer um, He's, he's also Rashid, um, he's from Kulna, uh, and he used to take photographs in the bazaar in the outskirts of Kulna with his box camera. He loved what he did, he made a living, but he didn't earn a stable future. And he now works as a day laborer in a brick field. But he has still kept his box camera. Uh, and, um, you know, I, this is the last image I'm showing. Um, and. The studios were sold, as I mentioned, to goldsmiths. Uh, they extracted the silver from them. But here is one photographer who doesn't have the money, is a day laborer, is working in the fields, but he still hung on to his box camera uh, because he values it so much. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very thankful for the Prince Lars Fund for the support they gave. We, we've only been able to do this. We would like to do it in a bigger scale. I was very happy and envious to see what Peter had done at that end. At our end, he, he did mention, for instance, that he needs stable, low temperatures. We can sometimes create low temperatures. We can't get stability. The fact that you don't have regular electricity means that if you actually cool down the storage, it would damage the pictures more because every time electricity goes, the temperature goes up and the fluctuation of temperature is actually more damaging than even the relatively high temperatures you might have um, than is ideal. But um, the reason we wanted to show this was because we felt this is a history, it's a living history which needs to be preserved and it remains unknown. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just give you the credit of the people who work and help. Please. I'm not the right person to answer because it wasn't my project I'm standing in, but I will try and do my best. So you have gone through uh, tons of works uh, by official photographers from all over the country. Uh, is there any general theme? I mean, uh, is there something that keeps coming up uh, in their non-commissioned works? Have you noticed something like that? Uh, the, the landscapes are there. In, some people have done families. Um, by and large, those are the two major things. And I must also uh, tell you that um, there wasn't as defined, except for the commission work, there was not as clearly defined uh, a separate genre of pho photography between the amateur and the professional. When they were not doing commission work, they were all amateurs. They did it because they loved photography and they took pictures of what they wanted to do. Um, roses, pets, uh, children playing, these were common tropes. Uh, Shadow, I, I, I missed the beginning, which I'm sorry, so you may have dealt with this. But how do you see the archival business happening in the digital age? How are we going to when somebody does what you've just done now and looks back over the next 50 years from the other end, 
how are they going to select, how are they going to find the, um, uh, the, the extraordinary aspects of another era that you've uncovered today? Well, I mean, there is a session perhaps on discussion of this, but to me, what you say raises a very, very important thing, because the politics of archiving is a very important issue. Who, collect, who decides to collect, who pays for it, uh, determines what is given importance and what is considered worth archiving. It might be someone from a personal point of view, it might be an entire collection, but one of the problems we've had is that our history is being remade every time there's a change of regime. And there are entire sec segments which are thrown away or destroyed because the new regime wants to erase that part of history. So it's a very pertinent question. I don't have a direct answer, but I think it depends upon who decides to do it and what their agenda is. Uh, we, because we were very interested in 71, we were looking, trying to get pictures from Pakistan of 71. We didn't know if Pakistani photographers had uh, photographed them. War photographers sometimes do. Uh, we knew that the Dawn newspaper had archived all their material. So we approached Dawn to look for images of 71, and they told us that the rats had eaten them, but the rats had specifically only eaten 1971. <laughs> so it was quite interesting. Thanks, that was really, really interesting. Um, I've just got a couple of quick questions. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the, you talked about the destruction of studios by uh, of Pakistani forces in 1971. Was that happening beyond photography studios? And do you know any more about that? And the other question I had was the photographs of the freedom fighters for, from 71, were the portrait photographers taking them in the studios? What was, could you elaborate a little bit more about that? Well, about, uh, for a start, we've actually only followed six. So I don't think, I'm qualified to generalize based on that. The destruction of the studios, we've only dis known of for Rat Shahi. Whether it happened elsewhere, we don't really know. Um, in terms of studio portraits in 71, that simply wouldn't have been possible. I mean, people were on the run. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. There's a famous photograph by Kishore Parikh where there's a Pakistani, uh, there's a soldier looking inside a guy's lungi. You know, he opens up his lungi and the guy's peering in. And the caption, as was for a long time, was that this person was checking, this was a Pakistani, checking to see if the man was circumcised or not, based on which, whether he was a Muslim or a Hindu. Now, that sounds plausible, except that had it been a Pakistani soldier, there's no way a photographer would have been there to be able to take that picture. So it is, it's actually a photograph of Indian soldiers searching for arms. So it's a completely wrong caption. But, you know, unless you find out what that is, and I refer to that because there is no way someone, a freedom fighter, could go to a studio and have a photograph taken when they're guerrilla fighters fighting against an occupation army. Oh, this one at the back, yeah. Um, I was saying that there was one picture back then, um, which was two men. Um, I was asking if those were staged, or was it a famine situation, or was it a, a disastrous situation, or was it staged? Uh, I'm not sure I, I um, know I'm, which picture you're talking about. I'm talking about the picture where a man holds another man in his arms. Uh, do you remember? Yeah, Perhaps you can tell me. I, 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 it's, I'm not the specialist here, so I'm standing in. But perhaps, I'm sorry, I, I can't recall the picture, so I can't give you an accurate answer. It's okay. Maybe later on we can have a look, and uh, I'll do my best. Anyone else? Yes, right at the back. Thank you, Shahidul. Fascinating sort of discoveries of, you know, literally new histories of photography being unearthed and being presented on the screen there. Um, one of the questions I had was about the lives of photographic societies. We know that they were established very, very earlier on. And certainly the one in Bengal is established in 1854. 
And there are several photographers, amateur photographers, who eventually join these societies. And what I find fascinating is the constant refrain that they have, especially in the post-independence era, to a kind of pictorialism. So many of the images that you have shown have this kind of pictorial lineage, uh, whether they're kind of genre studies, whether the kind of mannerisms are put forth before you know, um, the audience. And what I find fascinating, so one question is, of course, about uh, whether there are photographic societies, historical photographic societies that have existed over here. Uh, the second is uh, about this sort of you know, pictorial turn of photography. Um, in the 19th century, even in the post-independence era, this distinction between the amateur and the professional I find quite fascinating. And the amateur or the hobbyist, as they were called at that point of time, were meant to be or represent a kind of experimental quality of photography, while the professional was the more studio photographer who was doing things with controlled light and controlled conditions. And I find these divisions coming about quite interesting in your, you know, in your presentation because it's also about a kind of quotidian uh, around entering the frame. It's no longer the, the you know, professional studio photographer, it's the amateur hobbyist come experimenter that is coming before us. So one was about this differentiation between amateur and professional that your presentation shows. The other one is on photographic societies. Well, in Bangladesh, uh, partition is seen at 71 and not at 47. Um, so really, and for practical reasons, one of the things was that um, during the Pakistan period, it was the Pakistanis who were the business people who, who owned the studios. It was the Zaydis and things like that, and they left. So we really don't have uh, very much before that. A lot of the organizational work was also done by them. So we do not have a record of photographic, at least we've not come across it. The earliest record we have is of the Bangladesh Photographic Society, which was set up in 76. Uh, and the number one member was Bijan Sharkar, whose experimental photography was shown in Pakistan in 65. So he would have been involved because it would have been some Pakistani society which had organized it probably, but we don't actually have a record of it. In fact, the only uh, pictures which were collected were there was a Nazir Shahmed talks about how one of his images was used in the Family of Man exhibit. Uh, but that's the earliest record we have of a picture from there. But again, he was not part of a society. Uh, there was another problem, uh, which is to do with um, the photographic societies were considered uh, a threat by the photojournalists. So the Bangladesh Photojournalist Association had a, a ruling that if someone became a member of the Bangladesh Photographic Society, his or her membership would be cancelled. And Rashid Talukdar, who you're seeing there, was very interesting in the fact that as a professional press photographer, he joined the Bangladesh Photographic Society, giving up his professional membership in the press photographer's um, cadre as such. Uh, but we don't really know. But after 76, there were quite a few, and there was an attempt I think around 1984 to form a federation. Uh, by that, there was a lot of internal politics and things like that, and that died down. But really, that history doesn't exist. That's part of the history that has to be done. Uh, your other one was uh, about the amateur and the, yeah. Uh, again, I'm no expert, but I just found it very interesting that our most senior photographer, Golam Kasim Dadi, who died, in, uh, who was born in 1894. Um, his first picture was published, I think, in 1992 when he was 96. Now, this is a person who has his first picture published at the age of 96, and we paid him for it. But he always considers himself an amateur photographer. Please. Um, you're saying before that history is being remade or reestablished, so. How do you think that the erasing of history and, and publicizing new ones are affecting, the, are affecting the younger generation? History is always written by, you know, there, there's a very interesting uh, statement I, I like, which says, God can't change, um, uh, you know, God can't change the past, but historians can. Uh, and 
that is how it is. All histories have been written by whoever were the history writers or the recorders. Um, we had a particular problem when Robert and I tried to curate the first exhibit of 1971. We were going to, 71 is very important for us. We were going to show it at the National Museum the night before the, um, the show was meant to open. The show was meant to open the following day at 3 p.m. The night before that, the minister rings me up to say some of those pictures need to be removed. And these were pictures of the bayoneting of the Biharis in, in Bolton. Now, the all, war happens, and all wars do terrible things, and both sides do terrible things in all wars. We had done that as well. But our government wanted a sanitized version of the war, and therefore th those pictures could not have been shown. We chose to pull the entire show from the museum and show it elsewhere. Most people wouldn't have done that. Otherwise, had, they, had we gone on, we would have had a particular version of 71. Uh, and that, you know the subtext. That is how it's always been, sadly. Okay. Thank you very much. You've been very generous.